Here we go. We are here with RF Garahani. Thank you so much for joining us today, RF. I know RF uh, from actually back in Iran. Uh, we went to the same school, uh, Sharif. And uh, we reconnected after many years. And thanks to RF for reaching out and joining some of our WePost sessions. And after having some conversation with him, I thought it would be actually great to have RF as someone who has been an entrepreneur in Iran. And now he moved to uh, Canada in the last year, I think, uh, to tell us about his story and his uh, experience. And I think it would be interesting for the audience to start getting to know you, RF. Thank you very much, Ali. It was great uh, talking to you and reconnecting with you after such a long time. And I'm happy to be here. Um, your show, I think, is was one of the things that I spotted, like randomly popped on in my LinkedIn feed. And I was like, what is that? I know this guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Mental health? Well, why? This is interesting. So to me, it was like, something that you're looking for already you don't know what that is exactly and then you suddenly realize oh i'm not alone it's like there are many other people who are like me and i think what you're doing building a community bringing people together like starting a discussion around i mean in in, in the way that you can right and it's mm -hmm. just a starting i want to understand it, it's amazing i mean your personal story is also an inspiring one i want to understand uh, so it's not necessarily we are going through the same story, but it's kind of the same plot. So everybody is like hitting something, realize that, okay, this is not that necessarily working out for me. And I think this is what connect people. Uh, and it's great. I'm super happy to be here. Oh, thank you. Um, and I agree. And I think one of the uh, thing that made me think about inviting you to the show is your unique story. I think you, I know a lot of it because I, it, I, I can assume a lot of it. I also grew up in Iran. We also went to the same university. It's just like environmentally, we have experienced similar things. But at some point I left Iran, like I left Iran more than 11 years ago, but you stayed there and you started companies uh, back to back. And Finally, after many years, you left the country. I want to know how was that experience like, if you want to start even from growing up in Iran uh, and then mm -hmm. your experience as a student and then starting your first company or going from a one tech to another. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can actually paint a picture, that would be amazing. Yeah, sure. Um, I think this story is kind of like similar. So uh, there's this kid who... Is kind of smart, right? So uh, goes to a special school because because of that, and then goes to high school. And the funny story that I always share is um, we used to do this test, like which major should you pick when you go to college? I'm not sure if I shared this with you before, but uh, there was this form that you would have filled in, like what well, what interests you, stuff like that, and then. Uh, I think the way it happened is that most of people are going to study math and physics mm -hmm. because that was like a fashionable thing to do. And both of my parents were doctors. And I knew that I wouldn't want to be a doctor, something that later on changed. I don't know why, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, what happened was I filled in that form. And then based on the score, different scores that you would have got, you would have been recommended what kind of majors you should pick. And for me, the highest rank major somehow turned out to be forest ranger. So you need to become a forest ranger. <laughs> so I went to our teacher was like, excuse me, sir, this cast is telling me I need to become a forest ranger. And uh, he said something like, no, this must have been a mistake. Like, you just need to go study engineering. Well, okay. <laughs> so I go from what I still believe Forest Ranger would have been a better choice um, to study computer engineering at the most competitive spot that you could ever get to. Um, nicest people as well at the same time, but super competitive, super high pressure. And then um, one of our friends used to tell me in my entire undergrad was like, I did not study computer engineering. Although I, I have the degree, 
but I did not study. <laughs> so I did all sorts of different things. And then after that, because I couldn't really, this is like, you're at the wrong place, right? Um, I, I went on to study MBA because somehow that, that felt more natural because like not really quantity, there are no really so many right answers that you need to find. There is your answer. There is a there's certain level of individuality which you have with management, which you do not necessarily have with engineering. Engineering, you have a right answer. But when you're doing a Harvard case study, there is no right answer. It's like there is your answer, which could be right, could be wrong. So your version of it. So that was kind of started my journey of, okay, that didn't seem to work. And you have this unknown trauma of trying to be uh, the smart kid who also needs to know science, be good at math. Well, all of this is like what you're trying to achieve, but you're not really built to, to do probably. Although you do occasionally when you have to do an exam, you work hard to, to hit that goal and reach that bar every time, but it comes at a cost, which is, you never really start to wonder who are you, right? And then going into uh, industry, I think for me, it was like, yes, I studied computer engineering. This is what I could do. I went to work as a individual contributor um, when I started. And then I kind of immediately realized that I would not really fit to uh, the way that corporations are running because I have to be the one who come up with my own ways and was not really trained to follow what everybody else doing. So it wasn't really long before I would no longer a fit at any corporation. So it just happened to happen at the same time that startups started to grow in Iran. And I was lucky enough to have all the right titles, which is went to the right school, studied the right major, and also possess what on the surface is something which is a competitive advantage. If you're a person who wanted to become a forest ranger, right? So you must be uh, liking the excitement and, and discovering the new things and, and the excitement that, that comes with all that unknown territory, right? So mm -hmm. startups comes super naturally. I also have ADHD, which is something is like, you're neurologically wired to live in a chaos, right? It's like, okay, this is my jam. I mean, this is easy. So uh, I could not only survive, but I think I, I was thriving in that environment because chaos is is where people like me would, would probably survive. So not, not long that you, you realize, okay, I need to be a founder. <laughs> so I need to build stuff, build my own stuff. Um, and that's how it started. I think I founded an audiobook company along with two of my friends. And then I founded something which grew to become one of the largest delivery companies, I think, in the Middle East, probably in the entire world, I would say, like top 10. I don't know the exact numbers, but we're definitely uh, very big. And... I also helped my ex-wife building something, which I think is now the largest uh, e electronic health platform, which is in the which is in the country. So, yeah, that's kind of like a long version of where I'm coming from and what what I did. And yeah, um, it's been a year that I've came to Canada, and uh, again, it's an unknown territory. It's like super exciting. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna way. love I'm it. Not, not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not loving the weather. It's like very, very unpredictable in every way. <laughs> yeah, especially where you're based at. I think we were just in our pre-recording talking that it has like the one of the warmest summers and one of the coldest and driest winters. So yeah. it's actually funny. Uh, so there's a lot jam packed in your story and thanks for sharing and walking us through your entire journey, like from that forest kid, uh, forest ranger kid, all the way to 
uh, the dude who is now in Canada. Uh, and I think there are so, so many questions in my head. I'm going to start from the end of your story where okay. what, what encouraged you actually to leave the country and why Canada and we can maybe take it from there. I think there's a personal component to that, which is like, I'm looking forward to also help my family move. So choice of Canada was, um, except for the, the community that we have here was also something that I could already do. I had the permanent residency because at some point in the past, I already applied and I got the permanent residency. It was like this ranking program. And then when there's an exam and there's ranking, so like we normally do good. Right? So I got it. Though. It was something that I, I, I was thinking as a contingency plan a couple of years ago. Um, also lived for a while in Australia uh, for the same reason. But the actual decision to really leave what I had built before, which was, I mean, I'm still realizing how much I've left behind, how much of me was in there, because you're just assuming, yeah, I'm just going to move. Right? You, you have the self-inflated sense of who you are. You do not realize how much attached you are to everything which you're doing, which is your job people you're working, how you're approaching problems, how you're solving problems, how much meaning are you really driving from that? So I think uh, for me, I, I had reached a point that I no longer could articulate what is it am I doing? And I think one of my friends asked me some sort of question like, and it was like maybe one and a half years ago, something in the lines of, Hey man, six years ago when you started this journey, did you want to be where you are now? And my answer was, hell no. This is not what I wanted. Not to say I don't cherish the journey, I don't cherish the learnings, but I realized there is so much that I, I wanted for myself that I didn't really explore. And I could not see that really happening. Uh, back there, there was so much context that I was living in. So for me, like on very, very subconscious level, I knew that I had to change in a very dramatic way. Uh -huh. Would have been probably more reasonable that I would have taken like small steps. But again, ADHD, postponing, postponing, then you make these dramatic decisions. Okay, I need to leave everything behind. Bye. So I actually planned my exit for a year bring on board very good people. I think I left the company in a very good shape. And people might disagree, but that's <laughs> what, I, what story that I like to stick to. And since then, it has been, um, it has been a one, one educational journey for me about who I am, who I am not, and things that I don't know that I'm still exploring. So I'm at a point in my life, I think kind of like this is the start of a midlife uh, stage where I wouldn't say a really crisis, like what is life, right? So you start to uh -huh. face new limits, like um, how is it that um, as the, I don't know, chief technology officer for a company, you, you have a lot of authority over what you're doing. Nobody questions whatever you're doing, um, really. You seek opinion very openly. Um, that's how you, so, so you interface with the world from a position of, and that kind of shapes up your character in a certain way. And then the context changes and suddenly you're running on that old software, which is interfacing with the world very differently. But, and this is just also started like randomly doing, like going into job interviews, for example, just wanted to get a sense of, okay, what is it that I need to do? And then you suddenly realize there is so much of you which you have left behind and it was already embedded in that context where you were living. And then you have to either earn that or learn that or at least be able to articulate that in a way that people would understand. Like, what did you really do? So I remember like when I talk to people sometimes, it's like, yeah, I built this team, we just grew up to this stage and then this happened. And the guy's like, really? <laughs> it's like, yes, I did all of this. Like, 
sounds like a lot. And it's like, yes, it is. It is a lot. It's like, why are you here? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> so there's still a certain level of exploration to it. I wish I could have answered exactly why I did make that decision. I used to have this friend who, back when we were in high school, so he was singing a song in a language that he couldn't speak with the right rhythm. And then mm -hmm. the other friend of mine would have told me, hey, man, do you even know what you're singing? I was like, not really. But I know I'm doing it right. <laughs> I don't know what, it, what verse is it that I'm singing, but I know I'm doing the right thing because I see myself outgrowing myself every other week. And this is not necessarily to say it's great results, right? So there are many things that I didn't know about myself that I, I'm just exploring. And it's not always pretty, right? <laughs> so. I, uh, I'm actually so impressed uh, with the fact that, um, and I've seen it in other mutual friends that we have and some other friends that you may not know them, but I, I really salute you all for looking at this journey as a journey of getting to know yourself. I think it's so, it's such a, it's such an easy thing to say that, oh, okay, RF was a CTO at one of the biggest uh, uh, food delivery or delivery companies probably in the world. And then he leaves the country and the Middle East and the region and he goes to an unknown. Yeah, that's normal. Yeah, he had his time. Yeah, he's probably tired and burnt out. That's why he did it. Okay. It's it's so easy to look at these stories from outsides like this. But I think what uh, what's interesting to look at and learn from and for the folks who are listening, what's interesting for me to look at is I made this decision when I pretty much didn't have much to leave. But with you folks, and especially you knowing your story, you left something behind coming and looking at this journey as a way to get to know yourself. I think it's so interesting. And it just teaches me a lesson where when life gives you anything, try to make the best out of it, even if you don't know what that thing is, whether it's lemon or whatever it is. Um, but I think using that as a way to observe yourself, what am I, what am I not? I think it's mm -hmm. very interesting. Uh, what are, and I know I still have a lot of questions from your beginning of your story, but what are some of the uh, down days look like in your experience? Because I can imagine as an immigrant, I, I also had oh. my own story as an immigrant you know, like coming to a new country at the time. I, th I think everyone knows this story. I couldn't even speak English, honestly. Um, and I had my own personal struggles. And then one year later, I lost my father. And then all those oh, things happened God. that made it so complex for me, especially the first year was like jam-packed with events um, that I can't even like just go back easily i have to really sit down and meditate on it if i want to think about it so i want to know what are some of those struggles with you or has been for you in the past year i mean every aspect of life that you that my life that you look into you would you'd see lots of changes so um it starts with the, the way i look right so probably in the past three years and this is something for real i have Lost 25 kilos, regained 25, lost 25 again, regained, now 10. I'm, I'm still back at 10. It's like uh, four months ago, I started to uh, uh, realize that I've injured my hamstrings. So I'm no longer oh. being so active the way I used to like. Um, I used to be, and I like. So it also like changes your identity in a certain way. Like when you when you have developed the habit of regularly exercise every day or at least six, six days a week to not being able to go to gym, like that's that's something that you would realize on so many levels how it how it is hitting you. That and that's the simplest thing um, that I can mention. But in terms of um, network, I think you start to realize that okay all the connections that you have these are social connections that were just there right and you didn't even try to acquire those connections but 
once you immigrate, that's like an effortful activity that you have to do. I have to reach out to you, right? It's like, Ali, let's connect. I mean, I need to, I need to connect with some people, right? And it's not like people don't want that. It's like everybody has their own life and you kind of know a lot of people from the past. And that's for me, like, I'm really fortunate to have a lot of people who have already moved here. I had the similar experience of moving to Australia and there I just know like a handful of people. And I think it was a disaster, right? Here I have a lot of good friends. Um, my best friend from undergrad lives here. Uh, my co-founder from the first company that we built lives here. There's a big social network already that I can just easily reach out to. So I've been very lucky to have that in place already, but I still feel that social connection and we are social animals, right? So we need that social component in our daily lives, no matter how brutal your childhood has been and how much loneliness you've already experienced, which to me was like, I, I moved away from my parents back when I was 18. And I'm very used to not really seeing them, or meeting them. So it's not like I need a lot of social circle around me all the time. But even for me, who, who is already living off that kind of lonely life, um, because of a lot of reasons, moving here has been uh, something that, again, applied a lot of extra pressure. <laughs> <laughs> that you don't need. Again, I've been so lucky and so fortunate that I had this extensive people, a network of people who are living here and, and I already knew. Um, friends from high school, all over the place. And they all start to, when, once you reach out, you realize that, okay, I haven't really spoke to this guy for 15 years, right? But that's fine, right? You just, uh -huh. need, to, you just need to make the effort so I, I made a plan to really reach out to, to people who I knew. And it started to really turn around the way I started to look at things. At one point, I actually wanted to, and this was February, and in Toronto, that's not pretty <laughs> at all. Um, so and I think this was the time that I realized that I really need to uh, ramp up my effort to, to connect. And um, it, I think it yielded beautifully. Like I started to reach out to people. People start to tell you, okay, this is how you, you need to be presenting yourself. You need to make a decision. Do you want to do a job? Do you want to do a startup? But you need to make a decision. And if you don't have a decision, you will just drag along that undecisiveness with you. That's not gonna, uh, you will pay the cost, right? So if you don't know, that's fine. Like you can be the guy who doesn't know. But I'm also, person who needs to be doing something so i can't just sit around that's why i was just being so active and going to gym every day and doing a lot of running and i was actually preparing to do an um iron man event at the time when i realized that man with this injury and I'm, I'm not able to and this was exactly the time that i couldn't no longer uh, be physically active it's february <laughs> and that 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 I think was the lowest point, really. But from there, thank God, we started to turn around. It was like a short downtime. So I started to reach out. I decided to really explore professional opportunities here in in the market. I just wanted to get a sense, like, okay, what it is like to to I don't know, at least do a job interview. And this is what I started to do, like going into job interviews. Um, what would happen, like? And I walk into job interviews and I could interview people that who could be into who were actually interviewing me, right? Very easily. I'm like, okay, man, you need to you need to grow. That's evolve or die, right? So evolve. Learn from the experience and you might as well still go do whatever you want to do. You might want to do another startup, you might want to join a startup, you might want to go and join a corporation, but you have to do the exercise, right? So I started to mm -hmm. do the exercise talking to startups, working with startups, um, doing job interviews. And I started to really change. And with simple habits, like do things every day, I think it started to uh, work out beautifully. So I'm, I'm super excited um, to see what would happen as, as I go forward. Um, 
I'm not even this. sure I'm helping, I'm helping your podcast with my answers. <laughs> no, it is very interesting. It's, um, I think what's the way I'm seeing it is you've spent, I think, near 20 years building uh, your kingdom uh, in Iran. And you, you've been a founder and like the track record that we talked about, the school, and then continuously just like hitting the right uh, A's uh, in that path. And naturally, it should build an ego. Like that naturally, it builds a definition of you. And this is what I mean by it. A definition of you that's been protecting you for years. I don't think you've been even ever job interviewed in Iran. Like that, that's, that's probably my assumption. And yeah, there two we go. Times. I did yeah. two times. And probably those were very formalized just to make sure they're doing it, not for the really, yes. for the fact to understand who you are. So not even having any interview experience uh, in your late 30s and then suddenly coming to a country and fighting that ego. I think what I'm observing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, mm or add more colors if needed, like that February, although the season, we know how bad it is in Toronto and how cold it gets, but in, with that seasonality, you've been also like experiencing some downtime that really made you realize that you need to fight with that ego. You need to start like, the fact that you're down is because you're trying to push away some of those things. That's, that's what I was hearing. And then when you yes. started giving it a chance, when you started like yes. practicing things from small steps, that's when yes. you start like really connecting to your true self rather than your ego. Your ego is still there. If you want to use it, you can use it. Yes. But the fact that now you're able to just go to job interviews and say that, hey, like, what, what, why does it matter if I go to a job interview? What? That's the, there's nothing wrong about it. It's actually connecting me. Like you started finding your own values from what I'm seeing. You found your values of like connection. Like you're. Yes. You're an active person. You love to do things. I even remember you like back in our school. Like I knew how uh, you you were one of the active students uh, in our school. So we knew like we could see how active you are. And now it just makes a lot of sense. I think the dots are connected uh, for you mm. like because you found your value, in my opinion, to be connected. And like you, you sort of like started by taking steps to get to a job and do what you're good at. and then find that network and be connected to this world in a real manner. So that's what I've heard. Did I hear it properly? And then is there anything to add to it? I think it started like way before this point. But yeah, I mean, the, the, that description is a, I think I like that because like somebody talking about me and describing <laughs> it in a, in a heroic way. Like, I, I love that, right? Why not? But uh, I mean, somebody, somebody actually actually talks about you, right, and, and tells you something that you should have an ego, but you don't have an ego, and you're you're being you're doing a good thing. That's naturally what what I would like, right? <laughs> don't know about you, but um, the truth of the matter is that I've been practicing that for a long time without really knowing it. Mm -hmm. So it's also to some level part of my personality, which is not necessarily a good thing. So there has been moments in my life that I should have expressed more ego. Like I should have taken credit for what I've done. I should have maybe um, done things differently where because I naturally don't overuse what you refer to, I think, as ego. It's like I don't necessarily go to that place. But this is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, Help me in this situation would have would have been maybe a lot more difficult uh, without without that. But again, um, accurate picture. But the 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 journey started I think way before. Like, who are you? I started to learn there are parts of me who are not which are not really working uh, properly, and they're just with me. And I started to notice this when my team started to really grow. I could see how I'm hurting people. And as someone who is expanding a company, who is trying to drive a vision, um, a roadmap toward a certain vision in a certain way, within a certain culture, that's all, all, not always easy. Like I've received calls 
messages from people telling me you are the most horrible person I've ever seen, right? And this like wakes you up, like why? There's certain level of, um, I think, healthy arrogance that you should have, right? It's like, that's, that's who I am, right? I, I, I drive a company toward a mission. Otherwise, you're just doing not much. You wouldn't succeed. I mean, markets don't it, it, it evolve or die, right? That, that's the market mantra. But, and to, to people who are not a fit, you can simply say, okay, this is how we are as a company and you can leave. But there's also a certain level of um, self-reflection and emotions that comes with that experience of, man, there is something that you need to change, right? And it starts with, with you seeing signs. And I think the journey for me unfolded in a way that I started to really um, ask myself these questions. I was like, I'm limited in a lot of ways, right? And that's not the picture that you necessarily want to create for yourself when you're making a successful company because you have because other people are often seeing you as you're successful, you're building things, and people start to, I don't know, give you some sort of congratulatory remarks. But I think internally you start to realize all the things that you didn't achieve because how limited you were, like your insights, your manners, your vision, your capacity as a leader, right? Um, so I think I started this, this battle with me, which is you need to win where, where, where you lack certain things and you need to walk into that challenge. So I don't know why I started to, I told you about this story. Like I started to learn swimming, which I could never do, right? It's like now I've lost the 25 kilos. I can run. I've always been very confident about my ability, but I never was a good swimmer. I could actually not swim because I just went to learn swimming because I was much younger than much older than everybody else. And um, the teacher was just making fun of me. It just traumatized me to the level that I just couldn't go anymore. And then I don't know where, where it came from. Like I was like 35, 36, and I wanted to learn how to swim. Right. So I started to go to to swim. It was like this is my limitation. I have to I have to solve that, right? And then with everything else, like with people, like how much empowerment do you um, build in your company? That's also like as a leader who is kind of like has to be a control freak to some extent when you're doing a startup because you have to manage things. At some point, you have to let go, right? That's not always easy. That's what you have to practice. Every time that you let go, things will go wrong. So you have to practice. Okay, we didn't get the results that we wanted. Um, it went horribly wrong sometimes, but you have to live with it because that's how companies grow. So you have to grow for your company to grow. So that's like a, a thing that you have to practice on conscious level with your life, with your time, with every meeting that you go to. It's not always easy to know the right answer, but let everybody else arrive at a different decision. Say, okay, team, if that's your call, let's do that, right? That's, that's personal growth, I think. And fast forward to where I am now, I have all of that practice with me already, right? So I, when, I, when I talk to someone now, it's like, okay, this is the feedback. This is the impression that I made. That's my responsibility to change. I, I, I know this already, right? I have the levers. I've seen this before. My problem to solve. And then because you have all that experience of solving problems and changing yourself to change the, out, the outcome, then that comes kind of easy. Still very difficult <laughs> to actually go through. But uh, yeah, I think I've been, again, very lucky to have the network and I've already been practicing a lot of that, I think being comfortable with failing at so many levels that helped me in this journey. It's very, uh, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for adding uh, the added color here. 
because now it paints even a much more interesting picture because it tells me that you've been building muscles over the past few years due to your professional experiences and the kind of feedback you've received and then the question that it brought to you that like then why why am i doing this why does it sound like this to them that i'm being arrogant or whatever and now you're using those muscles in your new journey in the past year it's very interesting and i i want to know what are some of the things that you've done during that time like first of all what were some of the problems that you have noticed when you got such feedback from folks and then when you started realizing that something has to change about you or you need to grow in some areas what were some of the problems or questions or challenges that was brought um to you personally and then how did you kind of like go through that path to build that muscle oh okay that's a that's a good one so i think i i remember episodes of me maybe shouting at someone at the office like that's not me but it happened i remember like it was a shouting match like thank god nobody else was there so that experience taught me it's like man you're limited in a certain way so i think at that point of time i started to to notice that something is really wrong so i started to change a few things or two i've been so lucky to have people in my life who just showed me the next steps and in this case i think i had this friend who told me something like you need therapy and for me it was like being the arrogant person that i was like i've been to therapy because i have been to therapy at that point i had this again wrong impression that i know what's really going on and then this friend of mine really helped me get connected with the with the therapist and i think the therapist also pointed out all the right points and then guess what i stopped doing therapy that's like the natural thing to do like <laughs> and then three months passes and then i'm starting to hand off some of my responsibilities because i know something is wrong so already like a year past the point that my friend is telling me you need therapy it takes me six months to really start three months of going and three months of rejecting that entire thing although on deep level you know they're right right and this is i think the difficult part um i think rightfully so the the therapist pointed out something like you are behaving you're showing signs of um i think this is politically incorrect for a person to say um especially these days but the label was you're showing a lot of narcissistic defenses i don't know why but this is what i see and she was just drawing that picture for me and it was so difficult to to grasp that and now with like there's this i think stigma with with narcissism which i think it's a certain disorder that some people have right or maybe i also have i'm not sure <laughs> because that's just a percentage of population right that's a normal human response right that could be very maladaptive in a way that's not really changeable but there could also be a certain level of situational mm -hmm. um component to it like for example people who are working in the police department i mean based on assessment this is uh, the this is in the dsm version i think the latest one there's some cohorts of population who show higher level of narcissistic behavior right police officers for example and they're not bad people right medical students they're not bad people then one of the selfless things that they can do is to try to sell save other people but at the same time you develop this kind of because the, the problem is i think you start to become so right so often that you forget how limited you are that's the point like if you're a doctor like i respect all of them both of my parents are doctor doctors selflessly thing to do but at some point you start to realize that everybody has a problem and comes to you and you provide a solution right and you're sometimes right often right and then you get the results everybody thanking you 
you develop this natural response, which is like, I'm right. Same thing happens when you're successful. It's like, I am right. I'm fucking right. Like, and, and then somebody tells you, this is maladaptive. You need to be open. Uh, still, like, where you're not right. It doesn't matter how right you are. Like, it doesn't really matter. You need to just learn. That's that's the thing. If you're good, you can do better, right? If you're bad, you can still do better. It doesn't really matter. So I think this was a point, like turning point for me to realize that I have ADHD. I started to take my medications finally <laughs> after postponing it for a lot of time. Um, I started to do the right things with for my, uh, I would say, neurological and also psychological steps that I should have taken, like the, the biochemistry and biology, I started to get right. And also the psychology is like, man, I'm not broken. Um, I just need to upgrade myself. And then I restarted therapy. And I think past one year has been amazing. It's like every week I'm going to my therapist, like, you know what, what we discussed last week, actually made a change because you're now ready. Like, like you, you're, you're like this, I don't know how to describe it, but you're so ready to grasp all the insights into your life and make changes that it starts to really show. So I think therapy has been, a, but, but it took me like 36 years to be receptive. Like, I would say 10 years of actually first time that I started to do therapy, when I really started to see the real signs of, of improvement, it's already 11 years after the first time that I did it. And I'm happy that I got introduced to it much earlier. And also you start to realize what kind of therapy is helpful for you. Like a conscious decision that you have to make. Um, because you have this impression of, okay, I'm broken. I'm going to somebody and then they're going to fix me. But that's not the case. Like if the therapist is not working, you have to change them. If the approach is not working, you have to change it. You have to have the intention of, improving your emotional life, your psychological health, and your mental health. Otherwise, it's not a doctor that can treat you so you're now fixed, right? It takes some level of intent every time. Okay, what, what is it that you're doing? And my therapist was telling me, I'm always present in our conversations. And it's just, she told me this last week, like, um, you, do you think you have ADHD, but you're also so present? I record all, all of our conversations and I just go back to them. Sometimes I think, well, who is this guy who's talking, which is me. <laughs> like, I started to really learn from, from myself. So that has been an immense help in the past two years. Now, it's just like visualizing everything. And the fact that I didn't interrupt any part of it was uh, in parts, I was empathizing with it myself like it, it was at parts very similar to experiences that I had and I was sort of like trying to like see both pictures um, mm. to, to kind of like ask questions uh, and also calling out how mature of you uh, and uh, I think this is this is why why I love recording these calls to see people the way they really are and their stories and hear their stories their, the way they they really experienced it, like the fact that you speak about um, the uh, thing that your therapist mentioned to you that, hey, you might, you're showing some narcissism. Um, and also at the same time, like, I think it, the fact that um, there are characteristics and you painted the picture of a forest ranger for us in the beginning, that I think mm -hmm. forest ranger should also be uh, in that category of jobs that you may see higher narcissism, maybe. Yes. But I think it just yes. it just paints a great picture of the real human being and the real people mm -hmm. that we can be. Uh, so yes. I really thank you for that. Uh, and I think I think as far as uh, therapy goes, um, as I was again looking at both pictures in my head, uh, I think a lot of that is similar for me. Uh, growing up in Iran and I wasn't, I didn't grow up in a, um, a doctor's family. So I, I probably had even more stigmas around 
going to a therapy or what's wrong with you that you want to go to a therapy. So imagine all those stigma and the walls around it. And then for me, it took a very long time to be convinced that this is the path for me to find some answers and start at least observing myself. So the fact that uh, that that's kind of like the delta between your story and that I want to call out, it's not even uh, for folks who are living in Iran, it's not even that easy, at least in, for our generation, the millennials in Iran, it wasn't that accepted to go to therapy. Now, I think that the conversation is different uh, thanks to all the folks uh, who are really on the ground trying to change this thing um, and provide therapy at much lower rate and more accessible and also like the amount of content that exists on social mm -hmm. media. But I think in our generation, it wasn't uh, kind of like encouraged at all. Uh, so the fact wow. that um, you, you picked on that eventually, like those struggles, the struggles to pick up therapy, leave it, take it, thinking that you know the answer, of course, uh, and finally using it the way that you're doing. I think the, the cadence of like once a week is also very interesting. Uh, what are uh, some of the other things? And I think that's kind of like the segue way that we can maybe uh, shift the gears a little bit. But I'm curious, uh, you mentioned uh, you're uh, doing therapy and then you're also uh, doing swimming recently. That's something that you picked up. What are some of the other things that you do to keep your mental health at a level that yeah, you like to see? I started to realize that sticking to routines uh, really is helpful. So I'm starting to really, and this is something that I was doing very irregularly, not in an organized way, but writing things down, like in a journal way, is super helpful and it's always a good investment to relearn after you do it for a while so i started to do i've been doing this for a long time in an unstructured way like on a piece of paper on a, on a notebook on a notion and then every time you think you got it right but you got to get it wrong so i now kind of arrived at the system which is kind of working which is being intentional about a change that i want to do and I am now, I think, mature enough to really realize that, okay, one change is more than enough. Like, if you just can do just one change every quarter, you're already amongst the top 1% of the population. So be, be very picky about what you write, what you want to choose, and then be, be limited in, in what you want to do and the change that you want to make. Uh, so, so journaling made a lot of help. I think getting the biology right, as I said, like staying active, um, right sleep, right type of food that you get. I mean, this is like you're in this machine, which is 99% biological, 1% psychological, I would say. Um, so often like getting a good night's sleep <laughs> is is much more important than uh, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know, a therapy session, probably, right? Um, what else? I think getting the biology right has so many aspects, like staying active, right food, stuff like that. Um, and I think one of the other things that I started to pick from, I don't know, if I could call him a role model, is... Uh, I started to really like the way, and there's this guy, you might have known him, I don't know him already. It's called Ray Dalio. So he, he has this book called Principles. Um, and to me, he, he is sounding like a guy, he's already like 75, a billionaire already, not something that like much similar to where I am in my life. But if you actually listen to what he is really sharing, you see, ah, okay, that's, that's my story in a way. Right. So coming up with principles um, about your life that you really try to stick to and upgrade as much as you can and being very intentional and self-aware about what are those principles and what are those, mm -hmm. uh, what are the reasonings that you arrive at those um, principles. And again, in your journaling practice, that's how you would discover them. Um, because these are the things that really help you like 
I mean, my, my, my desktop background down there just telling me something every day. So I don't have to really make an effort to remind myself of that. It's like, this is the principle. I live mm-hmm. off by this principle. And then just constant reminders for yourself to, to live by principles that you already know, because sometimes you forget, you think I have the lesson, but just because you got the lesson doesn't mean you're living off, living by uh, that principle to your heart already every day. Right. So Mm -hmm. just need to remind yourself that, so it's boring way of saying practice, 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 (laughs) practice, practice, practice. I totally agree. And what, just to get an idea of those principles, uh, what are some of that look like for you? What are some of the principles that you figured out for yourself? If, if you can share it with us, it will help me to get an idea of how to define a principle for my life. Um, for me, I think number one is be curious. And be curious is in probably a two-word summary of who I am and who I need to be. To I, I will ask you why I could be disagreeable. It comes with a lot of package, being curious, but it pays off every time. Makes me happy, like puts me in a mood. That, ah, okay, that's how it works. And then that's so. This is something that in every difficult situation, when I enter this situation, I start to realize I'm having this conversation in my head, like I'm ruminating. I'm I'm paying some emotional tax with a situation. And I remind myself, what could you be curious about? Right? And then if you can ask yourself that question, it's like, what do I not know about the situation? And then that just gears up your, I think, prefrontal cortex in a way. It's like, okay, what is it that I'm not understanding? Right? And then it starts to make you reflective, right? The other thing, like and for another principle, is it's not maybe principles like a question, which is which part of it is really reality? So what is reality in this situation? What is made up? Because often, like facts are very few, but we make a lot of like subjective interpretation, which sounds like facts. Facts should be like in every situation, there are one or two facts, and everything else is your perception that situation so you will be able to identify what is uh what is reality which is something that sometimes you can change and sometimes you're not able to change but reality is often really hard facts you no way that you can i'm 38 that's it like you could be that's good you could be say that's bad it's like that's 38 you're no longer 28 you're not 48 you're 38 it that's that's just a fact all right You have this many number of years left in your life. That's kind of a fact, right? But everything else is, is it enough to do what? Everything else is super subjective, right? So again, in every every difficult situation, every problem that you face, remind yourself that what is really the reality? So these are the kind of things that I started to come up with. Um... Not sure if it is really helpful. But. No, it is, and uh, I, I thank you for that. It it and I I, I think it's very interesting to see how uh, passionate you're even talking about it. Uh, it just proves that. I mean, for me, it really helps to see what would that principle do to me. You know, like the principle should be so much of me that it makes me so passionate. Yes. It, it just makes me talk about it and like really enjoy. And you, you made a really good signal that in the first one, that be curious. Um, you said that because it makes me happy. And I think that's, yes. that's very important. At the end of the day, if, if we have our principles, if there are something that they're truly us, there's no way for us to not be happy. Even if at times we have to be struggling in a conversation, but we know at the end, that principle is going to pay off. And this is I, like I, something which you're already running, like your software, like in your brain is already being curious, right? And probably when you're suffering is because you stopped being curious for some reason, because you're, you want to make your boss happy because you mm-hmm. want to meet a deadline 
because there's something which has stopped you from your natural state of being, which is being curious. It's like, I need to know, I need to understand. And then that's just a reminder for yourself to be, this is like a cliche to say, be who you are, but know who you are and be you who are. I was like, I think the most cliche, but that's the answer to these questions are really important. And finding the answer is not really a rudimentary, right? Mm -hmm. I, if you ask me in two years, I might give you another answer, right? Because that's <laughs> that's how how it would probably evolve, like from where you're in your lifetime. Like, I don't know, if you're going through a tragedy in your life, probably be curious is not the best mantra to live. <laughs> like, okay. Because that would be why me. That, that's like, <laughs> <laughs> right? so you, you then you have to adopt a different way, especially if you're, I don't know. When I'm, I don't know, 75, it's probably not be curious, but that's what my background says. And currently it's working. That's amazing. Or maybe um, not working and I just don't know it. <laughs> I, think, I think it's interesting. And the, the time aspect that you mentioned is also very interesting. Like this, this thing is going to change because I'm going to change. I think yeah. it, it comes with me again. It's part of me and it's... It's something that helps me run today, but maybe not tomorrow. So I'm changing. That is going to change. So I love that aspect, that kind of like dynamic aspect of it that you called out uh, rightfully um, as kind of like the last question that we always love to ask our guests is if there's something, if there's an activity that you would like to be doing with some of our listeners for 30 days, what would that activity be? And uh, to help them with their mental health. You like a kind of a recommendation or? Yeah, and something that you would also do with them for 30 days. Let's say some of our guests, for example, in the past, they said, I would uh, recommend writing mantras once a day, or I would recommend, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, uh, I think, running uh, a mile a day, or things like that. Uh, I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would say do one thing that you know what it is for 30 days. And if mm -hmm. it didn't work, do something else. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you could just be focused about one thing, like this is one thing I want to do. Could be your weight loss system, could be nutrition, could be activity, could be reading a book, could be, I don't know, like telling people how beautiful they are or I don't know, whatever, right? Just pick one thing, do it, really do it. And then if it didn't work out, because... There is a reason that you want to do that. Just just change it. Mm. And I honestly don't think a lot of people are are just living by this very simple system, which is I just want to do one thing. And then once this is done, I would go to the next thing. And with that execution of what that 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 one thing, I will be intentional. Like if, if it's working, I will just double down. If it is not, I will change that. Right, because we often have so many problems. Mm -hmm. Right, we are often overwhelmed with the number of problems. Like the the, the actual system, if you want to do a startup, spend two minutes like per day just writing about your idea, like one line of code per day. That's that's how it starts. Like, do it for thirty days. I love the aspect that it brings into one. It's something that I like. And I have this conviction internally that, oh, I like to start running, for example, or I like to restart coding because I haven't coded for who knows how many years, right? And now just do it for 30 days. Don't, don't drop it during this 30 days. Don't drop it. Do it for 30 days. Commit to it for a time frame. Again, there's a time aspect here. Commit to it to a t for a time frame. If in the end of 30 days, it wasn't what you felt it is, Drop it. Don't be afraid of saying that I coded for 30 days and I didn't like it. There's nothing wrong about it. If anything, it helped you learn something new. And know, you know that the next 30 days, you're not going to waste your time learning coding. Exactly. And I, I, exactly. I love that. It's like I, I, I kind of, I, I sometimes force myself like doing these things even like for my social media management and stuff that instead of like having a one-off idea, do something for like four weeks uh, or the cadence that I, I kind of like measure my success in the performance of those posts and everything. Do, do that for 
four weeks, do 24, 25 videos and see how that works. If it worked, there are parts of it, again, like this is so agile and so product management of both of us talking. If it worked, <laughs> see which part of it worked, then you do that better and yes. drop this part of it. So I, I, I really appreciate it. This was a, this was a great suggestion. We're going to write that campaign and put it in the show notes. Folks who like it, they can join you. Thank you so much again for being on the show. If there is any final thoughts, anything that you want to share that you couldn't share earlier, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation and yeah, I would love to hear if there's anything from you in the end. Uh, thank you very much for, um, this is actually the second podcast that I've done my entire life. The other one was just <laughs> three hours ago. Um, so I'm, I'm not really good at this. I'm not also a super structured person when it comes to, so I'm, I'm passionate for, probably from the way I look. I just keep moving. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoy what you're doing, although I'm not really listening to, to any podcast right at the moment, because that's just probably at this point of my life, not really working. Like a year ago was working, now it's not really working. Um, but I think the act of putting yourself out there is so courageous and self-expanding that I think you're doing an amazing thing, first of all, for yourself and then for everybody who is coming on your show, including me, like I'm already another person. <laughs> uh, and then I think with everybody who also listens and, uh, I think this is how every great thing has started, which is one step at a time, one listener at a time, one episode at a time. It's great. Like I one wish guest to... at a time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one guest at a time. Yeah, yeah. So so keep doing what you're doing and I wish you all the best. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Um I'm also like so happy that we have reconnected and now uh, also recorded a, an episode together and I can't wait to continue chatting with you in future. And I hope everyone also like enjoyed this conversation. This was really fun for me. And thank you so much for being so open about your story. Uh, and I see you again sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank All you right, very cheers. much. Cheers. Cheers.